and welcome back to my channel. So today's case is absolute madness. It's insane. It has taken me weeks of researching and talking to people and trying to figure things out. And it is probably one of the most confusing cases that I have done so far. This is going to be an incredibly long video, so sit down, bear with me. You cannot miss a second of this video or you are going to be confused. I literally had all of the information in front of me and I still manage to be confused every five minutes. I just want to quickly note that I am still getting over some sort of illness. I feel fine. I'm ready to film. I'm just sounding weird still. So again, I apologize for that. So let's go ahead and jump right on into today's case, and that is the case of Jonathan Hamilton. Jonathan was 26 years old when he disappeared for the first time, and yes, you were hearing me right, for the first time after leaving his home on May 2nd, 2015. He was a type one diabetic and he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. He needed insulin shots regularly. He usually had to do quite a few in just one day span. And in the days following his disappearance, he was taken to the hospital two separate times by ambulance, all related to his diabetes. The doctors, each time that he was taken, told the family that he was in not the best health condition, that if he didn't maintain taking care of himself in the proper way that he needed to, it came to taking insulin shots, monitoring his blood sugar levels at all times, if he didn't properly do all of this and if he didn't make a few changes and seek proper, you know, further medical attention, there would be very severe side effects. Not just physical issues, but mental as well. Basically, different things could happen if you don't have diabetes and you're not aware, if you don't properly manage your insulin levels, it can lead to a whole bunch of things. It's not just, oh, my blood sugar's low. I mean, it can affect your entire brain. It can permanently damage your brain and bring up other different problems and, this is what they said was going to happen very, very soon if everything wasn't taken care of. He had lived at home with his mother Angela and his father Michael his entire life. Even though he was 26 years old, he had never lived away from home. He was technically considered disabled. He had been in a car accident at some point in his life and had to have a facial reconstruction. He had surgery in his hip, he had screws and plates. Um, and after that, it just was one of those situations where he could not take care of himself on his own. He had never had a job. He just hung out at home and was taken care of by his parents because of his conditions. On the morning of May 2nd, 2015, Jonathan left the house to go to the store. This was not anything out of the normal. He did this quite frequently. He took the family's 2008 GMC and went and grabbed, I think it was a Coke for his dad and a Starbucks for his little sister and got himself whatever he needed. Now, again, normal day, but he comes home and instead of parking the car in the driveway, for some reason, he parked the car in the middle of the road about one or two houses down. His parents didn't know this at first. He still grabbed everything he got, brought it inside, gave it to who it belonged to, and it wasn't until Michael heard the door open and shut again unexpectedly that he went to check to see what Jonathan was doing. Jonathan didn't say he was going anywhere else. He usually didn't go anywhere else, and when he opened the door, that is when he first realized the car never even made it in the driveway. It was literally sitting in the middle of the road a couple houses down. Now, when he walked out into the yard to figure out what was going on, Jonathan had gotten back in the car and he had brought the family dog with him earlier. At this point, something a little bit strange happens. Jonathan opens the door, just lets the dog run out and says to his dad, come get this dog before it's hit, and then he just drives away. While this obviously is strange behavior, keep in mind he had struggled with being bipolar for quite a good chunk of his life, and sometimes behavior in one of these episodes isn't exactly what you would expect someone to act like. So I don't think they were too concerned at first. Maybe he just needed to blow off some steam, he was going through something, but when he never returned later that day and he never contacted his family, they decided to file a missing persons report with Houston, which was the town that they lived in. He was immediately labeled as an endangered missing person because of his need for insulin so many times a day. His bipolar disorder and the fact that he had gone to the hospital 
twice for severe medical complications due to his diabetes in just the days prior. They heard absolutely nothing from Jonathan for two days and then on May 4th, 2015, he somehow ended up in the Best Buy parking lot in Bastrop, Texas, about two hours away from their home. Bastrop is not a place he would have gone. He did have a family member that lived there. They were incredibly close to this family member. He didn't have any friends that lived there. The only reason he really would have gone would have been to go through to get to Austin. That still didn't explain the fact why two days later he only managed to be two hours away in Bastrop. Had he been there this entire time, had he been in Houston this entire time still, and just happened to run out of gas in Bastrop, they didn't really know. The cops had been called to a scene because there was a car, which was the 2008 GMC, parked haphazardly in a handicapped parking spot and a man was apparently wandering around the car and just the shopping center acting strangely. Two officers that showed up on the scene were able to identify Jonathan. I have seen at one point that he was found in the, in the car. That's what one of the reports from the police officers said. I've seen another thing saying he was walking at a pizza shop nearby and I've even seen one claim that he was at a pizza shop across the highway in a completely different Different shopping center. Police reported that Jonathan didn't appear to be in any sort of altered mental state. He didn't appear to be having any sort of strange medical problems going on and when they searched him up they realized he was filed as a missing person in Houston so they called his parents to drive the few hours to come and get him. Angela asked the officer specifically how they knew it was her son because she knew that he had left his ID behind at home yet their answer was that they used his ID. Obviously not wanting to risk the fact that these officers might actually have their son they all hopped in the car and started the two-hour drive. They asked police if they would sit with John Jonathan until they got there or at least take him and detain him somewhere but because of his age and because of the fact that he wasn't causing any problems they couldn't actually detain him so they told him no and then went on their way. Since they had a family member as I mentioned before in the Bastrop area they decided to call him and ask him if he would go and sit with Jonathan and this family member happily accepted. While they were on their trip to Bastrop they received a phone call from Jonathan from a stranger's phone. Jonathan told Michael, his father, not to come and pick him up anymore, that he was going to go off somewhere. I don't think he named specifically where he was going to go, but he said that he was going to leave the keys in the car so that they could at least take the car home when they got there. They didn't think much of this because their family member was supposed to be there and watching Jonathan until they were able to get there, so they just disregarded his plea to not come and get him and kept on with their journey. Also, in this time frame, using the stranger's phone, he called his ex-girlfriend and told her that he had been robbed. Now, I've seen things that this ex-girlfriend apparently tried to text this phone number back and the person responded back in Spanish and didn't seem to know any sort of English. So, they were thinking it was just some random person that was walking along the road in the area. However, he never told his parents he was robbed, so no one really knew what was going on. They also had a few phone calls back and forth on their car ride from the family member. And this family member started asking some very bizarre questions. He asked if Jonathan had dementia, if he had some sort of brain poisoning, if he suffered from malnutrition. He was talking to them about his wife that had some sort of blood poisoning that made her act crazy and he said that's what Jonathan was acting like and he thought the same thing might be happening to him. When they arrived, the 2008 GMC was still in the parking lot, the keys were not in the car and neither was Jonathan, but the family member was actually there. All he really had to explain where Jonathan was was saying, we somehow got separated. It was obvious that the car had been left there for several hours unattended, so it didn't look as if the family member had been there the entire time. The doors were unlocked, the windows were down, and the entire car had been gone through. There was perfume spilled in the seat, all the papers were thrown absolutely everywhere. Jonathan's insulin that he had just refilled was sitting in the car, but his meter was missing. It was very obvious that someone had just gone through everything in this car. His parents spent hours trying to bypass the security system. They were trying to get the car to work despite not having the key like Jonathan said he would leave 
And this entire time they were trying to get the car up and going, their family member kept making very strange trips. He would just get in his car and leave for a few minutes. And it's not like he had to leave to go and get a drink or go to the bathroom because they were in a shopping center. There was food there. There were just plenty of businesses, plenty of places he could have gone to the restroom. So they were never really able to figure out why he just kept leaving for a few minutes at a time and coming back. And he was just acting very strange the entire time. They were trying to find Jonathan, and after they weren't able to locate him, they called Bastrop Police Department to file another missing persons report. When the police found Jonathan and realized he was a missing person, because they had technically found him, they labeled him as found. He no longer was labeled as missing. Bastrop Police Department did not want to label him as a missing person again, and I just want to give a massive shout out to the Vanished Podcast. I have listened to that podcast for so long, but the things that she was able to do with this case and the information she was able to get, some of which that Angela didn't even know, is absolutely insane. It's two separate episodes, I think both around about an hour long. I highly suggest you guys listen to it. You get to hear raw footage from the actual police department, but because I can't just take her podcast, she got a little snippet of the reasoning behind why the police did not want to label him as a missing person. So they said they decided because he was an adult and could make his own decisions that they didn't need to mark him as missing despite the fact that he suffered from very serious health and mental conditions. They said that his mother called in and I quote, claimed he was diabetic and blah 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 as if he was just disregarding all these different conditions that he had because it was just blah 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 and was just desperately trying to convince them to put him as a missing person and they didn't think it was necessary obviously his mother was infuriated they were treating it as if he wasn't in danger you know despite his age and this is usually across the board you'll see despite age if there is any sort of serious medical condition they will usually push really hard to try to find the person because they are in danger and they wanted nothing to do with it here is a picture of my son he has type 1 diabetes and without, and without insulin, he will die. Please help me find my son. His family, after they got the car running, decided to go to the HEB gas station to grab some gas and then went to Whataburger to eat where they met the other family member. Now, this is where the family member started acting incredibly strange yet again and said some very interesting things to Angela and Michael. He told them that they needed to, and I'm quoting this, search the woods for Jonathan. And if Jonathan was his son, he would take him into the woods, tie him to a tree, and beat him for what he did. Started to tell them all of the events that had happened that entire afternoon. He said that Jonathan asked him to take him to the Chevy dealership. Like, out of all things, his car was broken down or ran out of gas and he had nowhere to go. He was waiting for his parents to come and get him. He was labeled a missing person and the first thing he could think of when his family member got him was that he wanted to go to the Chevy dealership. And his reasoning behind it was that he wanted to buy his dad a new truck. Now this sounded completely off for multiple reasons. First of all, Jonathan, as I said before, had never worked in his entire life. He didn't have any sort of savings. He used what his parents gave to him and he didn't have pretty much anything on him at the time. So even if he wanted to go and buy his dad a truck, he wouldn't have had the means to do so. The dealership was across the highway from the Best Buy, so it was in pretty close proximity, but also, it just wasn't something Jonathan would do in general, according to his parents. While they were ordering their food, the family member then took an important call outside, which they later found out was actually the Bastrop Police Department. The family member never told them that that's who he was talking to for some reason. And they actually ended up finding out that on this phone call, their family member told police he had never even been with Jonathan that day, that he had been working all day long, which was obviously a lie and contradicted what he told Michael and Angela. They then went their separate ways, the family member and Michael and Angela, after eating at Whataburger, and Michael and Angela stopped really quickly at a McDonald's for her to use the restroom before their long trip home. 
When they got there, they noticed a few police officers sitting outside and eating. So Angela approached them and asked them if they knew about her missing son and if they had any more information. She did not get the response she expected to get. They started intimidating both Michael and Angela. When she was asking questions, they didn't even know who Jonathan was. They claimed he wasn't a missing person. The officers started running checks on both Michael and Angela. They checked both of their cars, the GMC and the car they had brought there. And then one of the officers said something very, very strange. He said, if I wasn't on duty, I would tell you a story. No one really knows what that means, but it sounds incredibly odd. So Michael and Angela immediately left after being terrified and confused after having this encounter with these police officers. And at this point, they were becoming very suspicious about what was going on, especially their family member. He had acted so strangely the entire time and right after they parted ways, he ended up getting into a car accident. And to add suspicion to his entire story, they found out that the car dealership right across the highway, the same one that he claimed Jonathan asked him to take him to, that day had reported a burglary of a car. Now, someone had broken into a car, taken random personal items, nothing worth any sort of value, and just left. He sat together with the call to the ex-girlfriend, and they started really wondering what in the world was going on. So now I want to get into what happened, or the best we know of what happened, after Jonathan came in contact with the police department. So Jonathan somehow showed up on a private property two miles away from the Best Buy on a middle of nowhere country road. At the very front of the property after the gate was a garage and in the very back of the property were a few houses and a few different families lived in these houses. And the property line backed up to the Colorado River. This is where Jonathan met up with the stranger that lent him his phone to call his mother and father that day. His mother likes to refer to this man as the Good Samaritan, um, John Lorden in his video and in the Vanished podcast, I've heard him called Justin. I want to note really quickly that the owner's daughter, the owner of this property, had told Angela that the Bastrop Police Department didn't interview her or her family until April of 2017, so almost two years after Jonathan went missing. So I'm not sure how much information they had necessarily about this encounter with Jonathan that this family had, but police officially didn't have anything until two years later. So the person Jonathan first met on this property was the Good Samaritan, and this person did not actually live there, but he knew the owner's daughter. That's what everybody said. He had bought a Jeep from this person and was working on it in their garage. According to the family, they had no idea that the Good Samaritan was on their property at the time until later on when there was an encounter with Jonathan. Jonathan knocked on one of the home's doors and started telling a very bizarre story that made the entire family very uncomfortable. The man that answered the door, I don't know exactly who he is, but he told all the rest of the family in the house to kind of stay back because Jonathan was saying some very strange things. He told this man that he just used one of those things that moves in water, um, that's how he described it either a canoe or a kayak, everyone is guessing. He said that he lost his oars and then stumbled upon their house. While this man was talking to Jonathan, he said this is when he realized that the Good Samaritan was even on the property. He said he noticed a flashlight going around the garage. I don't know if maybe this Good Samaritan was looking for Jonathan or what exactly happened, but yelled out, the Good Samaritan replied, and that's when the family first knew that the Good Samaritan was on the property, according to their statements. The story that Jonathan was telling made absolutely no sense because the location where the car was and the location where this home was means that Jonathan Jonathan would have been canoeing upstream. Now, that alone is difficult, but there are so many other factors in this that make it 10 times more difficult. First of all, where did Jonathan get this canoe or kayak? Second of all, Jonathan didn't know how to swim, so he wouldn't have willingly put himself in a pretty deep body of water. And according to officials, the Colorado River there is incredibly deep. 
Also, according to the family, they will stand at the edge of the woods and watch kayakers pass by and those people won't even notice them. When you are in the river, you can't see through the woods to even notice that there are houses there. So he wouldn't have just, you know, quickly climbed up out of the canoe or whatever, first of all, because it, he couldn't swim, and second of all, because he wouldn't have known to get out there to go ask for help at these houses. And then to add to that, there was no riverbank there. There was no, like, small little beach that he could have pulled off on. It's a giant cliff, essentially. There are so many discrepancies to follow this that no one really has a good grasp on what exactly happened. The chances of him being in the river because he didn't have a canoe and couldn't swim and wouldn't have seen the property already kind of dismissed that fact. He would have had to walk up from the road, which makes sense because the Good Samaritan actually claimed he saw Jonathan first. However, this Good Samaritan also said that Jonathan was soaking wet and so he gave him a change of clothes. Now that means that he's supporting Jonathan's story of coming up from the river which makes no sense but if Jonathan had come up from the river he would have met the houses first and not the garage so it literally makes not a bit of sense. And then when it comes to the actual family that opened the door for him, they can't even agree on whether Jonathan appeared wet or not. The wife of the man who answered the door claims that he was soaking wet, however, she was also told to stay towards the back of the house, so no one really knows how well she saw him. And then when it comes to the man himself, he claims the whole reason he knew the story was off was because of the fact that Jonathan didn't look like he had been in a body of water. He knew that Jonathan would have had to swim over to the bank in order to get off of this canoe. There was no getting out of the water without being in it first. So this means we have multiple people saying he looked like he came from the river and then one person saying no there's absolutely no way. Police did end up checking. There were no reports of canoes or kayaks missing and there also wasn't a report of one just showing up somewhere downstream. So this story wasn't making sense. So now we're going to go to the Good Samaritan side of the story. The Good Samaritan claims that Jonathan showed up acting very strangely, so he offered to help him. He gave him a gray shirt to wear. I don't know if he gave him pants as well, but because he was wet and dirty, he gave him this to change into. And then he claims that, I guess, this interaction happens with the rest of the property and then he offers to take Jonathan to Walmart and he buys him a whole bunch of bananas, a gift card for $25, and a pack of cigarettes. He then said that he left Jonathan in the parking lot and went back to the property to grab his tools and told Jonathan he would be back at 11.30 on the dot to pick him back up. According to the Good Samaritan, he frequently helped transients and some of the homeless population. He gave them a place to stay, you know, somewhere where they could start getting up on their feet until they figured out where they wanted to go and he planned to do the exact same thing with Jonathan. But he said that when he returned, Jonathan wasn't there anymore. He claimed he circled around for a while trying to find him, and after he couldn't, he actually parked in the Best Buy parking lot and waited there and slept there all night long, saying he was just going to be there in case Jonathan showed back up. I find it very interesting because the Vanish podcast couldn't get anything from the police on this Good Samaritan. The Vanish podcast was able to get, thanks to the Freedom of Information Act, over 600 pages of documents and files on Jonathan's case, and that is absolutely unheard of. But for some reason, they would release nothing, nothing on the Good Samaritan. Instead, they told her that they would just give her a brief version of the story, which I'm about to tell you now. So this is what the Good Samaritan told police officially. The Good Samaritan said to police that he took Jonathan back to where the GMC was, but it was gone because the parents took it. He told them about the trip to Walmart, but to them he mentioned that Jonathan asked if the pharmacy was open. When they realized it wasn't, he said, I think I will be okay. So this leads me to believe that since he left his insulin in the car, that's why he wanted so badly to get back to the car, which is why they went there. But when he realized it was gone, he realized he was out of his insulin and he was freaking out a little bit. I might have been feeling some sort of negative effects from not monitoring himself properly. There's no telling when he ate that day. So they next went to Taco Bell. The Good Samaritan said through the course of the meal, Jonathan started to calm down a little bit. He was acting a little more in his right mind. So clearly the effects of not properly 
monitoring his insulin started to get to his body and thankfully eating started to fix it but that just goes to show you the state that he was going through at that moment this is when the good samaritan claims that he left jonathan in front of taco cabana now taco cabana is about five minutes down the road from the best buy where jonathan originally was at across two highways i think in a completely different shopping center and like he said to everyone else he left him there and said he'd be back at 11 30. so quickly i want to backtrack to a story that someone on the property told to angela before i go deeper into the good samaritan story the owner's daughter said that jonathan didn't show up to the property until 11 pm that night which makes no sense and doesn't really match up with the rest of this timeline while it makes sense because the Good Samaritan used a flashlight, so obviously Jonathan was there at night and the entire family remembers it being at least dark outside, the Good Samaritan claimed that they went to Taco Bell. I personally checked the Taco Bell that they went to and they close at 10 p.m. If Jonathan didn't get there until 11 and he spoke to basically the entire family first and the Good Samaritan and then they went to Taco Bell, they wouldn't have even arrived at the Taco Bell until like 11.30 midnight. That also throws off the fact that the Good Samaritan said he'd be back at 11.30 p.m. to pick him up in front of this Taco Cabana. The call reporting Jonathan as a suspicious person walking around was called in at 4.12 p.m. that day, so there were plenty of hours of sunlight between this time period. So he would have had to have been wandering around for hours essentially to not show up to the property until 11 p.m. Now keep in mind as well though that they weren't formally interviewed by police until two years later so I'm sure some details could be off. So do you look deeply into this or do you just chalk it up to it's been two years. She also told Angela that her brother followed Jonathan and the Good Samaritan in the town to Walmart. He said after the whole entire interaction and how strange Jonathan was acting, he didn't want to just let this Good Samaritan leave with him and hope nothing bad happened. He told her when he got back that he followed them all the way to the shopping center Best Buy was in and that the Good Samaritan ended up leaving him in front of Subway. Again, this doesn't make any sense. Subway is in the original shopping center where the Best Buy is, but the Taco Cabana that he was left at is literally five minutes away across two highways. So while they're close, it's, you know, different areas, different stories yet again. The daughter did change up her story quite a couple of times, and at one point she even told Angela she didn't know the Good Samaritan very well. But this girl's mother, so the property owner's wife, told Angela that her daughter and the Good Samaritan were actually dating. So why did she want to keep that fact hidden from Angela? She also told Angela that after her brother had a bad car accident, her whole family became really close to the two officers that just so happened to be working the case Jonathan was on. They helped with the accident. They pretty much, I think, saved her brother's life. And so she made it seem like they were really close with these two officers and she told Angela she would help in any way, shape, or form that she could. However, again, another lie caught because of the Vanished podcast. The Vanished podcast received a video of the family stating to police that Angela only contacted them out of greed and they wanted her to just go away. So now we're back to the Good Samaritan story. As we know, he left him at Taco Cabana and what he told Angela was that after he left him there, when he came back, he wasn't there. So he slept in the parking lot. Well, he told police something different. According to him, he dropped Jonathan off when he couldn't find him he circled for a little bit and then he went home but this isn't where the discrepancies end the good samaritan told police that jonathan had borrowed his phone that night to call his parents and he even was able to recite perfectly the entire phone call and angela confirmed it jonathan called his parents and said oh so screw me then and angela responded to him no what are you doing please let me come get you and then the call was disconnected now while that matched up literally almost word for word jonathan had claimed it happened that night but angela 100 percent specifically remembered it happening the morning of the fifth so the next morning the morning after the good samaritan 
claims he wasn't with Jonathan any longer. He tried to retrieve phone records to prove this discrepancy. She was 100% sure, despite filling out the application to have this form sent to police as well as herself. For some reason, the phone company never got it to anybody. But they were able to confirm that at some point, Jonathan was actually at the Taco Cabana because he called his grandmother. When he called his grandmother, he referred to it as Fiesta Cafe, but he meant Taco Cabana and he told her that he was feeling very very sick and then he quickly ended the phone call after saying he needed to go throw up. Jonathan's family at this point was so incredibly confused, so many conflicting things were happening. Years later, after the Vanish podcast covered this, they were even uncovering more conflicting information. And honestly, it would only just get worse and more confusing. They were told by Bastrop PD that at one point their officers had contacted their family member to come and get Jonathan. Yet they failed to mention that to Michael and Angela and their family member did as well. They also found out that this phone call that he took while they were at Whataburger, like I said earlier, was a phone call from Bastrop Police Department, which he didn't tell them. This confirms that police definitely didn't wait for this family member to get there to take Jonathan. So despite being labeled endangered and missing, you know, even if they did take that off, he is still an endangered missing person. They should have waited until at least some family member got there. But he also said he wasn't with Jonathan to police, but described an entire set of events to the family. There were multiple calls during the entire trip up there about Jonathan's behavior, according to this family member. The family member also told police on this phone call that when he arrived to the scene, Jonathan wasn't even there anymore, but somehow he was able to in detail described the clothes Jonathan was wearing in a separate interview by police and it was the clothes that had been given to him by the Good Samaritan, meaning that he had also seen Jonathan at some point later on that night after he spent time with the parents, after he knew the parents were still looking for Jonathan and went home and he didn't call anyone and tell anyone. To this date, he is now retracting any and all statements. He claims he never saw Jonathan that day, that he never told that stuff to Michael and Angela and Michael and Angela and this family member have not been in contact since June of that year. Police came forward with other information and interviews that were given to people People that witnessed Jonathan that night and two people in particular gave the same story that Jonathan said he just wanted to get away from his life which now introduced the idea that maybe Jonathan was just running away no areas were searched at all due to the fact that they really had no idea where to search you know, keep in mind he was an adult and they didn't really want to file him as an endangered missing person I Think that was kind of mishandled. To some extent, the police officer's hands are tied. They had no idea where Jonathan went that night. There are so many discrepancies in everyone's stories that there is just no telling what actually happened. So there wouldn't have been an efficient search had they decided on some random place to search to begin with. Essentially, just very basic work was done on this case and that's pretty much it. So Angela had to start doing a lot of the digging herself. This appeared even offered to cover this case at one point and Bastrop Police Department contacted Angela asking her if it was okay if they let out some information. You know, at this point, they just wanted his name out there because they had no idea where he could be. And Angela obviously immediately agreed, but after weeks of hearing nothing, she contacted Disappeared and found out that Bastrop Police Department had never gotten Disappeared the information that they needed by the deadline. And after further digging, she realized it was because the person responsible of doing that decided to go on a two week vacation before sending any of this information in. And now Disappeared will not cover his case, which I think is absolutely crazy. I don't think that should dismiss it altogether, but maybe there are things that I just don't know. Michael and Angela decided to go ahead and sell the GMC because Jonathan was the only one that used it. And it was kind of just this bad reminder sitting in the driveway that was depreciating in value and not being used. While they were cleaning it out, they found a few strange things that had not been in the car prior to Jonathan driving it to Bastrop. 
they found blood spatters on the ceiling liner and a black book with business cards in it. Astrop Police Department was called and someone came out to take the liner to be tested. Angela took the time that he was there collecting this information to ask as many questions as she possibly could. At this point, she wasn't getting a lot from police department anymore, so she took this as a great opportunity. She found out that this detective's younger brother was pretty good friends with the Good Samaritan. And she also found out that the Good Samaritan admitted to knowing the family member they had sent to help Jonathan that night. Angela freaked out and told him all of the contradicting information that the family member had told the police department, the fact that he had told her all these different things, and so the detective asked to go ahead and take a witness statement about it. He then moved on to the vehicle where he took many pictures and then cut out and collected the liner, but Angela noticed his very odd, or I guess a lack of technique in collecting this evidence. He didn't use gloves, he didn't use a clean knife, and he definitely did not use a proper evidence bag. After he left, Angela decided to deal with the personal items in the car herself, and this again would send them for a tailspin. She took the business cards and called the person they belonged to, only to find out that these items were the items that had been taken from the car that had been robbed on May 4th, at the Chevy dealership. So what the heck? However, this man also claims that tools, a key fob, and a remote were taken out of his car as well, but none of those items were found in the GMC and none of them have been found anywhere else so far. So this means that Jonathan, and according to the family member himself, did actually go to the Chevy dealership that night and there was possibly a robbery like he called and said to his ex-girlfriend, but maybe it wasn't Jonathan being robbed. Something happened in and those items from that car ended up in the GMC. So why break into this car? Why only take personal items? And why was there blood spatter? And when the blood spatter was tested, despite its method of collection, its results came back as animal blood. But again, the Vanish podcast got a bit of information that the police had not disclosed before. They actually couldn't find the origin at all of the blood, so they just labeled it as animal blood. So they didn't really know for sure. According to Angela, there are two different types of ways to test blood. I'm not personally familiar with this, and they chose one of the less accurate ways because they said they didn't have the funding to do the best way possible. Despite the family knowing there was no reason for animal blood to be in the car, they didn't hunt, they didn't, you know, do anything like that. Their dog was completely safe, nothing happened to their dog. That didn't stop the police department from coming up with their own strange theories, one of which involving animal sacrifice, which explains their largest theory. Police believe that he became a part of a religious group, possibly, or the homeless population. Jonathan made posts on a Facebook page that a lot of people didn't know existed, and a lot of them seemed to be religious rambles. But he spoke a lot about wanting a god to protect him and take him home. So showed police that he wasn't happy with where he was at and he was planning on traveling and running away. He even posted a picture the day he originally went missing on the second of a pot of food that was apparently made by a homeless man he had befriended. So the day he went missing, he was with some part of a homeless population. He was talking about wanting to leave and find his real home. He had also told a few people he believed he was Jesus. He was clearly mentally struggling and being off all the medication he desperately needed. There was no telling what his state of mind was in, so they honestly believed he ran away, joined some crazy religious cult where he had to sacrifice an animal in his car or something, and that was that. At this point, Angela was on her own. The police department was saying they were doing everything they possibly could. There was nothing more. She had given DNA samples. They had his dental records. If he turned up somewhere, they would be able to identify him. So she decided in 2017 to call back Bastrop Police Department to ask about the call logs that night, the night that someone called in this strange man, aka Jonathan. The woman who took her call said that there actually was no sign whatsoever of Jonathan in their system, period. So she directed her to another detective. 
once they were able to get in contact a few days later, this detective searched through all 174 calls that were received that day. He found that on May 4th at 4.12 p.m. was when someone called in and reported Jonathan a suspicious person. Call log states that police that contacted him immediately said that he wasn't in his right mind, which contradicts everything they said to Angela that day on the phone. They said he was stable, he was fine, they had no reason to keep him. They also said he was heading to Walmart, possibly hitchhiking. He kept digging and even called the attorney general's office where she spoke to them about how she wasn't satisfied on how the Bastrop Police Department was handling things and they were absolutely appalled the fact that possibly the last few people who saw him were never actually formally interviewed other than over the phone. So then they referred her to the Texas Rangers, but the Texas Rangers had already been involved and they said there was nothing they could do. She was just stuck. And then the Vanished podcast revealed another thing that Angela and Michael didn't know. In 2016, a tax return in Jonathan's name was made for Goodyear. Despite police actually knowing this information that Jonathan's name and social security had been used, they never told the family. He is at this point considered an endangered missing person. So this information should have immediately been dealt with but it wasn't. Head of security at Goodyear states that Jonathan's name and social security actually wasn't in their system at all, but there was a social security number very similar to Jonathan's. They found this person who was located in Oklahoma and they started questioning him, but he was completely cleared and was legitimate. He was not Jonathan. However, there was for sure someone using both Jonathan's name and social security card, whether they worked for Goodyear or not, that was receiving checks. So Goodyear reported it to Social Security and they were supposed to find out the last known address, this person committing fraud and claiming to be Jonathan or possibly Jonathan himself. But after they sent off this information for one reason or another, they stopped responding to all calls and emails to Angela and the police department still did nothing with this information. Using an analyst, Angela found that the last place Jonathan's phone had pinged off of was on Frost Lane in Winters, Texas. She called Runnels County Sheriff Department, the county Winters, Texas is in to ask about this and received an incredibly strange response. The sheriff thought it was so strange that Jonathan's phone last pinged in that location because he had received multiple other phone calls from people in regards to missing persons whose phones last pinged in this specific location. You guys, when I saw the location that these phones were pinging, chills all over my entire body. It is in the middle of nowhere. This is a dead end road, literally a dead end road, goes to absolutely nothing in the middle of fields upon fields upon fields of empty farmland. There's nothing. Why are all these missing persons phones being pinged in this location? He ended up checking the area. I don't know if it was just by pinging the phone again or physically going and checking, but no phone was found. So that was that. The same analyst used some sort of other system where he scanned the last location that Jonathan was known really physically to be at. He was seen by someone, which was the property he was found on. And this man claims that there are a ton of cars along the property that Jonathan was seen on. So this makes things incredibly suspicious, but again, after turning all this in, Bastrop Police did nothing. She tried to get Texas EquiSearch out and unfortunately Bastrop Police Department would not let them come and search and wouldn't even let them put Jonathan's missing person poster up on their website. Local mental hospitals have been checked and his family have gone themselves to walk all over Austin, which is a main place he might possibly be if he is a part of the homeless population now. They've been to soup kitchens, they talked to the homeless population, but so far he's not been found. And given the state of his health, he would need insulin. But unfortunately for the family and fortunately for those who suffer as homeless, there are places where the homeless population can go and receive different types of insulin and not have to say their name, not have to pay for anything, just in order for them to survive, which is great. And I'm so glad things like that exist, but he 
could possibly go be going to one of those and there's no way to track it so there's no way to find him there are a ton of theories in this case and the main one is that there's some sort of cover-up slash corruption going on this family were the last group of people to claim to be with Jonathan they have you know according to this one analyst and I'm not sure if this is even true or not cars just in the river by their property this good samaritan people think it's very strange that he befriends and helps these homeless and transient people some of the easiest people to target because no one will come and look for them and then you know all of a sudden at the same time all these phones are pinging in this location a lot of people think there's some weird thing going on with this family that there's something so wrong with this good samaritan but i will say you know police gave up a ton of documents on this case they I've listened to interviews. From what I've seen, they've been very forthcoming. I 100% believe that they dropped the ball quite a few times. I honestly do. I, I understand that given the circumstances, it's really difficult, honestly, to, you know, blame police for anything when it is an adult, 26 years old, legally, you know, they're bound to specific laws that they have to keep to but at the same time the fact that he is labeled an endangered missing person I don't know I just wish there was more that they could do I just I do find it interesting that they seem to have close ties with the family and they seem to purposely be making sure very specific details are kept hidden I guess you could say like the Good Samaritan statement, tax return, and Jonathan's name. Why didn't they tell the parents? You know, all these little bits of information that seem like they would close everything up and make the case break wide open. For some reason, the police are hiding it from the family and hiding it from pretty much everyone. And it took the Vanished podcast and Angela busting her butt to get this information from them. And then even when she follows up on it and sends them all this other other information they don't respond they have nothing to say about it they won't look further into it so I definitely think there is some sketchy sketchy things happening when it comes to the Bastrop Police Department what did they mean by if I was off duty I would tell you a story you know what does any of that mean it why did it take two years to interview this family I just I don't get it I don't get it at all and then it comes to the fact that the family knows the family member that helped Jonathan and then the family member is lying about everything. It seems like everyone has this story that they tell and then when someone else contradicts it, they take everything back and claim they don't know anything. It's an incredibly strange situation and I personally don't know what to think. I highly suggest you guys watch John Lorden's video on this. I will have it linked down below. I also suggest you listen to The Vanished podcasts I got two totally different vibes from watching them both when I listened to the vanished podcast I really got the feeling that there was some sort of cover-up going on but then John Lorden did a really great job at explaining the other side and making you think you know yeah what are what are the reasons for this what would everyone's motives been but you know to add to that someone's been using Jonathan's name and identity to receive paychecks. Like, I will say missing persons, this does happen. People who want to go off the grid, people who want a new identity will take usually identities of deceased, sometimes missing persons. So it could just be a random occurrence. But the fact that, you know, Goodyear contacted Bastrop Police Department and all of a sudden they stopped responding and nothing was found out of it why why was nothing found out why did everyone you know who angela asked and had follow through with things that got them so close to a possible answer all of a sudden just stop responding to her one thing that's another possibility is that he was without his medication and he had been told by doctors in the er you know that if he didn't take care of himself he was going to do permanent damage to his brain he could be in a totally different world in his brain right now and someone could have taken advantage of that winters texas where his phone last pinged and i'm not sure the date in which it last pinged but that was i think three or four hours away from bastrop which means 
he somehow got there. I don't think he had much more money on him. He obviously couldn't feed himself. The Good Samaritan helped him do it. The Good Samaritan had to buy him things at Walmart. So how did he get four hours away? You know, it's just a lot of really strange, contradicting, confusing information. And you can either chalk it up to the fact that it was years and there were a lot of stories involved. And, you know, given the circumstances, I'm sure it was very stressful, you know, with Jonathan being in the state of mind he was in, he was probably scaring and confusing a lot of people. So that could also have, you know, clouded people's memory because it might have been a little bit traumatizing and scary for them. You just, you don't know. It could be that or it could be the fact that they're purposely changing their story and they're purposely hiding things. I'm so interested to see what you guys have to say down below. Do you think this is one big cover up? Do you think Jonathan just really did run away on his own? He mentioned wanting to do it. He told them not to come and get them. He told people that he wanted to leave his life life? Or do you think he was just trying to get away for a little bit because of the state his mind was in and someone took advantage of it and now people are covering it up? Let me know what you guys think down below. In the end, his family just wants him home. He was six foot two inches and he weighed around 210 pounds the last time he was seen. He had brown hair, brown eyes, a scar on his eyebrow and a scar on his hip from his different reconstructive surgeries. He was last seen wearing jean shorts and an Ezekiel shirt, but according to some counts, the Good Samaritan gave him a gray t-shirt. I, again, I don't know if the pants changed. And he was in brown suede-like Coleman shoes, size 12 and a half to 13. It is very possible he is still in this specific location. There are some counts that he might be in Louisiana, and he is more than likely a part of some homeless population or religious group if he is out there. So please share his missing persons poster as far as you can. Thank you guys so much for your constant support and help on this channel. Make sure to get the story out as far as you can. The more people that know, the more chance there is that he will be brought home. Thank you guys so much for watching. Give this video a big thumbs up. Subscribe to the Howland family to help me bring them home. And I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye.